Creative Control is supported by HelloFresh.ca. If you live in Canada and want fresh, wholesome ingredients and recipes delivered to your front door, visit HelloFresh.ca for more info. Use the promo code CREATIVE50 to receive 50% off your first order. That's HelloFresh.ca. They plan, they shop, you cook. is an innovative musician, composer, visual artist, writer, and producer based in New York City. An original and founding member of Sonic Youth, Ronaldo has altered the way many people approach poetic lyricism, guitar playing, and singing. His latest solo rock song album is called Electric Trim, which is available around the world via Mute Records. Lee and I caught up in Toronto recently to have an extensive chat about every song on Electric Trim, the musical risks and departures that this record represents, his role as a creative consultant on the HBO show Vinyl, the working methods and current status of Sonic Youth, and much more. Sponsored by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, Granddad's Donuts, and Hello Fresh Canada, this is Lee Ronaldo on the 354th episode of Creative Control with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Lee, welcome to Canada. Yeah, it's nice to be back, uh, my, <laughs> my second home in a way, and uh, uh, it, it's always good to be here. I yeah. really love it. And welcome back to the show. I feel like yeah. it's been a few nice years. Nice to see you. Yeah, I think the last time we were Skyping and you were in Brazil. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was the first long distance Skype I had done. Well, that's funny. I was just there for three weeks, like a week, I came back a week ago from oh, three okay. weeks in Brazil. I was working on a, a soundtrack for a movie and um, and then did a short like one week tour after that okay but uh, I love Brazil and you know it's really funny that you mentioned that because Brazil keeps popping up no matter where I go like I can't escape it and th- that's fine because I really love the country and I've been there uh, I've been there twice in the last year and, I'm, and I'll probably go again in a couple months okay cool yeah yeah you do a lot of work, art, like art related projects and yeah things. art related but I've been playing a lot of shows there recently and people have been really responsive and uh, like I said, I was working with this Brazilian director, like a young director, his third film uh, about the film is about a band from this town called Brasilia, which is like their Washington, D.C., the oh, capital city, okay. really weird city built in the middle of uh, of nowhere in the 60s by by like a couple pretty well-known architects, this guy Oscar Niemeyer, and the whole city is totally futuristic looking and, and really weird. And I've uh, spent some time there the last two years. Brasilia. Brasilia. Okay, I've never yeah. been. I, yeah. yeah, it's their federal district or okay. whatever you want to call it, but it's a really, really weird city. And uh, and everything looks like a 60s version of like flying saucers and modernist buildings. It's all like super curvy shapes and really weird, ambitious buildings and uh, everything is super far apart. There's no way to walk anywhere there. It's like a driving city for sure. Okay. But it's really kind of fa- a fascinating place. And this guy from there, his film director, is working on this film that's ostensibly about a, a young rock band. But he's using it as a um, as an impetus to talk about Brazilian politics. I mean, they're going through the same kind of... Uh, upheavals there that we are in the states oh with really like trump and conservatism and uh, when i was there a year ago they had just kicked out a kind of populist president this woman dilma and put in this other guy and uh, everybody's up and up yeah i remember him this and stuff and uh, so that he's using this this film about this band to to talk about young people in brazil and politics and punk culture and stuff like that and uh so you're so scoring I was, it? No, I was recording the oh. band that's going to be in the film. Oh, I see. Okay. It's uh, like a young band of they they got real musicians to play the band. I keep joking that it's kind of like the Monkees or something because it's a band put together for the film from people that kind of knew how to play music and looked good and like a couple of them had a little acting experience. Mm-hmm. But uh, they got some people to write songs for the band and the songs are great and the band is totally kick ass and uh, so we spent like a couple weeks in a studio recording oh, stuff for the movie. Must yeah. have been a thrill for them to work yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah, it was. I think so. <laughs> I, I mean, I suppose so. But it was just fun all the way around. I mean, cool. I'm digging deeper into Brazilian culture and Brazilian music and 
you know, beyond uh, all the stuff we know, Caetano Veloso and, you know, Os Mutantes and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. There's such a deep, rich music culture there. So I've been getting more and more into it. Nice. That's yeah. great. So speaking of uh, different cultural, I don't know, elements, I suppose, this yeah. record of yours, by the way, congratulations on Electric Trim. Thanks. Real Thanks. departures here for you, I think, yeah, sonically. It's, it's, it's quite a big departure. Yeah. And... Um, I'm pretty happy about that at this moment. It's it's you know it came about through a, a new rela- relatively new relationship I have with this guy from Barcelona named Raúl Fernández. They call him Refri Raf- there. He's pretty well known in Spain, right. and uh, they call him Raúl Refri or Refri. And he's a producer and a player. He's he's a multi instrumentalist and a composer and you know all this stuff. He's he's you know I think he's in his early 40s or something right. like that so I call him a young guy <laughs> but uh, we met a couple years ago we did a project in in Spain over the course of about a week with my band the dust called acoustic dust where we did oh yeah that's right like, versions yeah. of stuff from my first two records in an acoustic setting and mm-hmm. then the label that's associated with primavera sound put that out and they brought this guy Raul in to do it and we really hit it off and and he kept saying back then, like, I'd love to work with you on a new record of, like, new songs, yeah. you know? And and then in 2015, like, I don't know, the end of the spring of 2015, he called me up and said, like, I'm coming to New York for two or three weeks. You want to just try some stuff? And, like, I'd been sending him some, like, crude acoustic demos. And he came and we started in, in the studio and uh, in the Sonic Youth studio. And, like, it just, like, from the minute we started, it was like, wow, we've really got something cool here, wow. you know? And so for the next year, he came from Barcelona, like, every every six weeks for, like, two or three weeks. And uh, then towards the end, I went there, and we, we mixed half of it in New York and half of it in his studio in Barcelona. And we just had, like, the most amazing time working on this record. It was it was kind of like all these different things fell into place. And, you know, he wanted to kind of challenge me to break out of my mold a little bit and do things a little bit different. And I was kind of feeling ready for something mm. like that, you mm. know? So in contrast to the to the last couple records I had made, which were really centered around a band, you know? And, and in, in particular, like a band with the same kind of lineup as Sonic Youth, you know, like two electric guitars, bass and drums. And like Last Night on Earth, my last real record before this one, you know, the band, got together a few times a week in a rehearsal room for like a couple months until we really knew the songs and then we hung up the microphones and everybody played and we you know we made yeah. the record yeah and this record was done in a completely different way we started from these really crude acoustic demos i had and we started each song by like me tracking the acoustic until we had something we really liked and then we put it into the computer and like spend a day or so like moving parts around and, and like working on the structure like yeah. well what if we try the chorus in the front or the you know the verse second after the chorus or whatever and then once we locked them in we just started working from there like building up in a very studio fashion like sometimes he'd be like all right give me a few hours and he'd layer in some electronic drums and some sampled sounds and uh, like a song slowly started to emerge, you know? He seemed to be a busy, like I, I noticed in the credits, like he, your re- referee, if, yeah. <laughs> if I may refer to yeah. him by his nickname, seems to play a lot of stuff on your record. Yeah, yeah, he He's plays a lot player. of stuff yeah. on the record. And, you know, he works with a lot of uh, Spanish different kinds. Of, you know, he's got his own kind of rock band mm-hmm. over there, but he also scores like TV shows and film stuff. And lately he's been working with these two different young women who sing, who sing flamenco. Oh, okay. And in either in more or less traditional ways, like some, and so he's been he produced these couple records for these two different uh, women, and I, they're they're like the kind of records that go gold in Spain. You know, they're yeah. like really a big deal, and they yeah. play like two thousand seat halls, and it's usually just him on acoustic flamenco guitar and one of these women who's just got this amazing voice, and you know they're steeped in that tradition of that music over there, but. Anyway, we just kind of started, and every song it was like, well, what do we need? Let's try some electric guitars. Let's try some more acoustic guitars. Let's try a marimba. Let's try a tambourine. Let's bring Nels in. Let's bring Alan in, you know, all the different people that eventually played on it. But it was just kind of a fascinating process where there was no band. There was never a moment where more than one person played at us at the same time. And we were just kind of building them up and trying to find the songs Mm. in, in in the music. Right. Which was you know it was i keep referencing like those classic records from the 60s like pet sounds or revolver or dark side of the moon or whatever records that almost couldn't have been made without a studio you right, know they're, right. they're really records made where the studio is like the dominant instrument sure, besides yeah. guitars or pianos or organs or whatever it is and this record was kind of made in that spirit like we spent 
so much time together and it was like never it was never less than completely fun and interesting like we had a blast making this record and you know it was it was a discovery process from from the word go and so on one hand i was in all this uncharted territory with raul working on the music and um i wanted to kind of do the same thing with the lyrics for this record yeah. i really wanted the lyrics to be also you know i wanted ways in which the whole process of making the record was more social and less like just everything coming from me here's the tunes here's the lyrics here's the words and so I asked uh, an old acquaintance of mine, Jonathan Lethem, American author, very well known. Yeah. Uh, I know he's done some songwriting uh, endeavors before, and I asked him if he'd collaborate with me on the songwriting process, on the lyrical process. And he was totally up for it, and he was living in California at the time, teaching out there, and we met in New York and kind of went over some things, and I started sending him these same crude demos without any words or anything. And then once we started building stuff up in the studios, uh, in the studio, like I started having some ideas about lyrics and you know maybe some of the songs I had like three lines or maybe mm. I had a chorus and nothing else and mm -hmm. just started sending him these sheets that were mostly just like empty like you know one two three four here's a line of a chorus <laughs> five six seven here's another line maybe and you know and send him stuff like that and um and oh, Jonathan wow. so he is, would flesh it out a little yeah bit? Jonathan's oh. a word guy like he knows huh. how to generate words and sometimes like the next day he would send me back like every blank line filled in you know, and then I would look at him and say, like, well, I love this, I hate this, cross it out with a red pencil, send it back to him, add some stuff of mine reacting to what he wrote. Oh, and fascinating. Like, we sent stuff back and forth like huh. that. And, you know, in some cases I had almost the entire lyric of a song and was missing, like, two lines or a couple words here or there, and he helped me fill them in. Huh. And in other cases I had literally almost nothing, like three lines out of a song that has, like, 40 lines of, of lyric, and he filled them all in, and then we kind of played back and forth or sometimes he sent me something out of the blue saying like well this doesn't go with anything you sent me but I like this you know I've got these four lines they've been sitting in my drawer for like the last 20 years I know they're good I just don't know what they're for <laughs> you know and those four lines became this critical chorus in one of the songs and you know in other cases yes yeah, stuff he sent me became like you know the verses of songs to my right. choruses and things like that and it and so on the lyrical front as well I was kind of putting myself in this really uncharted territory in a way and you know the last few years uh, when I was much younger I was really into the Grateful Dead yes yeah and the last few years I've kind of reacquainted myself with their music and you know kind of opened up to it again after years of just being like no I don't go there and you go to like the last big shows? I did I went to those yeah. 50th uh, Fare Thee Well shows yeah. I went to the first one they invited me to play some after party and it was a chance to oh, wow. play with Ira from Yola Tango and this like kind of all-star indie band and we were playing Grateful Dead songs. And uh, so I went to the show and it was it was just amazing kind of and it really brought back all these feelings and I went with three of my close buddies that I know from high school back from the day when we used to go to a lot of Dead shows. Right. And so we all went together and then after the first show it was like, I'm not going home tomorrow, I'm gonna see if I can see the next one and end up staying for all three as it turned out. <laughs> And I was also involved in this project you may have heard about that the National did called Day of the Dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where they covered like 60 songs right. with an all-star group of like vocalists. You know, Will Oldham yep. sang a few and all different people. Sharon Van Etten, who's on my record, sang a couple. And I sang one or two and played on a couple. And listening to the stuff that they recorded with all these different uh, people playing Grateful Dead music, one thing that imp really impressed on me was how great the songs were like you know mm. you don't have to like half hour noodly solos to, to to say like wow they made some great songs and part of that was down to robert hunter this guy that yeah, the, was the writer, their yeah. lyric writer yeah. who was you know he was a full-fledged member of the band but he was never on stage right. he was always behind the scenes writing these great words and you know so i was thinking about hunter and i was thinking about that period when dylan worked with jacques levy on desire which is one of my favorite dylan records and you know dylan who who does dylan need a lyricist for he worked know? with he did and work yeah, with robert hunter and he as worked well with robert hunter yeah. a couple different periods yeah, yeah, yeah. back then and, and recently together through life yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 and um i just thought like wow it'd be really great to have someone to bounce ideas i see oh of interesting in that level so huh. I had thought about asking Jonathan on my last record, Last Night on Earth, and kind of never got around to it, and the songs kind of got written without him. And this time I asked him early on, and so, you know, I was in this place where musically we were doing all this stuff that I'd never experienced before in terms of the way we were making this record. And, you know, being a kind of a studio geeky guy, 
I'd always kind of dreamed of making a record like this where you're really working in the studio and trying different things and playing stuff forwards and backwards right. and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And Sonic Youth kind of almost approached it once when we did that Whitey album, the Chicone oh, Youth yeah, Whitey yeah. album. Because right. that was a record where we said, like, let's block out two months in the studio. We have no ideas. We're just going to start somewhere and see, you know, start at point A and see if we get to point Z or whatever. But that was the only time we really ever worked like that. And so this was a chance to do that. And yet at the same time, I was doing something similar with the lyrics. I was saying, like, you know, I'm going to throw my lyrics open to this whole new level of experimentation working did you not with do Jonathan. Did you not do that in Sonic Youth or The Dust lyrically? I, no, not no. really. Sonic Youth, there were periods where we'd fill in lines for each other or yeah. trade lyrics a little bit, especially in the early days. But um, mostly lyric writing in Sonic Youth was, I mean, I think maybe Thurston and Kim collaborated yeah. a little bit more, but... It was usually a pretty solitary you're activity. On your own. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And lyrics in Sonic Youth were always the last thing that ever got done, which is why that's always the way I still work till this day. We always concentrated on the music as compositions. Right. You know, so I felt always that that was our strength in Sonic Youth is that the music because we worked on the music to such a degree before we had any lyrics, the music had to hold up, you know, as musical composition. And I think that was one thing that made our song structure so interesting. And lyrics were always like when the songs were all done, sometimes even when they were all recorded, we'd say like, all right, who's going to sing what, you know? And then we'd be like, oh, right, you take that one and go home and you take these two or, you know, whatever it was. That was pretty common that we would do oh, that. Oh, I didn't realize that. We, we worked, we almost never had anybody singing while we were working on our mm -hmm. lyrics, which was a, maybe a weird thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, and may have led us down some interesting structural uh, scenes, but and I think maybe it was another reason why our song structures were always atypical because there was never anybody right away saying like, no, the verse has got to go here. You know, we didn't, we didn't really think about that. But stuff you're singing right away. Your, each of your approaches to singing and uh, what I always associated with your own individual lyric writing yeah. was so unique and distinctive. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's fascinating yeah. to hear. There were songs where um, you know, like Murray Street, there was a song that Kim sang and a song that I sang, and at one point. I was supposed to sing the one that she sang, and she was supposed to sing the one that I sang. And she was like, "You know what? I'm not. I'm not feeling this one. You want to trade? Oh, you know, oh, wow. before we'd gotten very far with lyric writing." And, and it was like, "Okay, you know, she took one uh, sympathy for the strawberry, and I took another one that became like Karen revisited or oh. whatever." And you know, at first it was, you know, it's like kind of like oh, like dealing out the cards at the <laughs> end, which was kind of a funny, odd way to work. You know, another odd, abnormal thing about the way Sonic Youth worked and wrote songs. Right. Um, but um, yeah, so this record was made like that, and I, I felt like on both lyrical front and musical front, I was in very uncharted waters, which made it a really fascinating process. Yeah, and I feel like some of these themes of, of communication and alienation and growth and yeah. aging, it, it all comes yeah. through, and I, yeah. I'm i looking forward to this. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, the other thing that was really weird about this record was um, somebody made a feature mi f film about the making of this record. Oh. And if they didn't send it to you, they will, because they've been sending it to most of the, the people I've been oh, talking okay. to. Some okay. of them have already seen it. But a friend of mine that I know from, from university when we were both studying film together, you know, he, he'd heard that Raul was coming over, we are gonna start this process, and he was like, you know, I have no idea how you make a record. I, he's been, he'd been a guitar player, but he was like, I, I've never been in a studio, I don't have any idea how a record gets made. Do you mind if I come that first week when you're there with Raul and just like shoot some, some stuff on my video, digital video camera? And he got really excited about the project and came like almost every week that we were there for the whole year wow. and edited together this feature film. and. You know, normally when you see a film about the making of the record, it kind of centers on like a band playing together. Yeah. And this record had none of that kind of right. thing. So, I mean, in a way, it was a very interesting record for him to make this film doc about because it was such an unusually made record. Yeah. You know, it was always just like one of us playing at a time and all this stuff. But, but uh, it's kind of cool that this record of all the records has this, you know, film. this feature doc, oh, okay. doc about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll check my sure email. That, maybe yeah. I got it and I missed it. Maybe, that. maybe I'll I make sure they okay. hook you up. Okay, uh, yeah, I want to see this. And you know, before we start talking about the songs, if you if they didn't send you like the album art, you know, besides just the front cover, yeah, you know, I really want them to send the lyrics and the album art. The, all the art is by Richard Prince, who did the Sonic Youth, uh, Sonic Nurse yes, sorry, record, yeah, yeah. and is you know somebody I know since my first days in New York when he was also playing in oh, bands okay. as so many people were then Jarmish and you know Vinnie Gallo, all these people Basquiat, they were all in bands before they separated out into their different artistic disciplines and Richard Prince was one of these guys mm. he was doing stuff with Glenn Branca in the early days and things like that and 
you know, we stayed in touch and I was looking for um, cover art and I saw that picture of the, the, the country road with the tire skid marks on That's it. That's right, Something yeah. Something about it I really responded to and so I wrote to Richard and he was like, yeah, I'd love you to use it. And then in the end, we, he sent me a bunch of other images that are all throughout the record, okay. which is, I really, really love what he sent well, me. I appreciate really a cool addition. Yeah, I appreciate the thought you put into the packaging. And yeah. It is weird in this day and age, right? Like I get a, a file, I get just digital files yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I've been. I, I forgot to tell them, or maybe I did and haven't reminded them. But I really like someone. You know, you used to get the record. Yes. You know, and yeah. the record is still the important thing to me. Yeah. We spent such a long time making the artwork really nice, and you know, you figure if someone's writing about your record, they should see the credits and the reviews. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, the, the 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 pictures and the the lyrics. And it's all part of it. Yeah, whatever's in the package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know. Well, let's see how I do okay. with what I have. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we are. We're going to go through the songs one at a time. We're going to start uh, with the first song, Moroccan Mountains. Moroccan Mountains, yeah. I was filming against the light when the landscape dropped down and we fell into the crack between the window and the world. For 20 years or more, we had our screwdrivers out trying to disassemble the panels, trying to find our way back to the mountains, but nothing worked. We tried prying the door with a bow made from the branch of a fig tree, but nothing worked. The train conductor kept repeating, this is the last stop. It's time to tell you It's time to tell you what I'm looking for It's right back in your home You're gonna take it down Down on the town again When you stand there You know, it wasn't, oh, it's a long song. It's a, It maybe is an odd song to lead off the record with. And it was one of the first songs where we, we felt like we really had something cool. It sounded really cool. It had all these cool parts. And, you know, it's like seven or eight minutes long. And at one point we were like, okay, we were, when we started talking about sequencing the record, we were like, let's start the record off with, you know, a poppy hit song, sure. you know, Circular or Uncle Skeleton or something like that. And we kept coming back to Moroccan Mountains, like, yeah, it'd be really cool to start with this song. And then I was like, nah, we can't start with an eight minute song that's kind of meandering and all this weird stuff starts with spoken word. And, you know, and then in the end, we felt like maybe we should start with a song that lets you know the minute you like put the needle down or put the CD in or whatever, you know, push the button on your computer, <laughs> more likely, that um, you're in for something different. Like, yeah. This is not a typical opening song. It's like it lets you know that, you know, this record's going to take its time and do its own thing. And so I'm really glad we started with that one. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a lo loosely built around uh, memories of some trips I made to Morocco, mostly in the 90s and late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, I got a chance to play with those master musicians of Jujuka there. Oh. You know, the guys that Brian Jones went there in the yeah, yeah, late yeah. 60s and made a record with them. And uh, they're on that Ornette Coleman record, Dancing in Your Head, right. with uh, when he went there with the music critic Robert Palmer and recorded some tracks with them. And, uh, you know, Burroughs went there and, you know, all those people went. You made, made a little pilgrimage. You, you made a pilgrimage we of We did. We yeah. went there into the village because um, the guy who was the young leader of the band, who was the son of the guy that was the leader of the band when, when Brian Jones went there and Burroughs and all those people, uh, he lived in the East Village near my partner, Leah Singer. And he was married to an American woman who was a photographer who documented a lot of Paul Bowles. Hmm. And she lived in Morocco for like 30 or 40 years and took a lot of photographs of Paul Bowles. She's like maybe his foremost photographer. 
And we got to know each other, and we were going to Morocco, and this guy Bashir Attar, the leader of the group, said, like, call me when you're in Tangier, maybe we can go to Jujuka, and we did, and, you know, we spent the night there, and I played all night long with these guys, and, you know, they have all these rituals and traditions, They're smoking this keef stuff, you know, this marijuana, and, like, uh, it, was, it was a crazy experience, really unbelievable experience, right. this little village at the top of a mountain with no running water, no electricity, you know, grilling a goat over an open fire spit and all this stuff. I mean, it was kind of amazing. So this, 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 the tune was started sitting in my bedroom in New York on top of this Moroccan carpet that we brought back that was like blood red with these yellow mountain shapes all on it. And like I was sitting there one afternoon and playing this, this thing and like getting deeper and deeper into the tune and the part where it kind of like raves up and everything and just... Uh, it, it, after that, I called the the tune Moroccan Mountains just because of where I was sitting. And oh, then, I see. Okay. You know, so that's kind of how it started, and um, and then the lyrics kind of are loosely about a bunch of things. They're not directly about Morocco, but the opening story, this kind of like um, I don't know. It, it, it there's some funny stories that are just tangential at this point, but the opening story about. Um, you know, watching the landscape and the landscape dropping down and falling into this crack between the window and the world. Um, I'm filming against the light? Yeah, I'm, I was filming against the light when yeah. the landscape dropped down and fell into this crack between the window and the world. This this references this ridiculous event that happened to me and my crew of uh, my band, touring band. Uh, we were on a train in the south of France this is a goofy story. And we were, we were on this train, you know, riding between shows in the south of France. And I had a brand, at the time, I had like a three-week-old iPhone 6. Like, they were brand new. I got it right before the tour. It was like this beautiful, gleaming <laughs> hunk of metal and, and LED screen or whatever. LCD a new thing? Screen. Yeah, a new thing. <laughs> exactly. And, like, I had it pressed up against the glass of the window, and I was filming the landscape in slow motion. And I thought, like, okay, it seems like it's staying there. And I let go of it, and it was just like stuck to the window and then like the train went over a bump and it jostled and it it w fell down into the heating vent oh, no. between the, the wall window. of oh, the train no. and like the panel on the inside and it was like ridiculous and then the conductor comes through and says like your stop is in like 20 minutes or something like that and like we were totally freaking out and like we had our screwdrivers out and we were trying to unscrew the literally like just like it says in the song we were trying to unscrew the panels of the train and like it wasn't happening oh i didn't even know and, that was like, literal we finally okay. <laughs> like i had a bow from playing the guitar and I, my guitar tech wrapped the end of it with backwards gaffers tape and like he was sticking this thing down like he was fishing down into this hole like this really narrow slot and like the conductor came through when we were like undoing the panels and started yelling at us and like I started screaming at him like my phone's in there I've got I'm gonna get it out and you know he's like and the, the our options were like get off the train in Grenoble or wherever and like make our gig or miss the gig and like the next stop was Paris like three hours later and like screw the whole day up yeah and like a minute before the train pulled into the stop my my Portuguese guitar tech grabbed the phone on the end of this gaffer's tape he stuck it to the to the violin boat like eased it out of the crack and like we grabbed it and like <laughs> grabbed all the gear and like hopped off the train <laughs> it was just like this weird thing but in the end it found its way into the oh, song interesting. And some, like and it had nothing to do with morocco but it, you know it kind of uh, i integrated it somehow well as you're singing there's this exuberant swell where yeah. you, you start to yeah. yell yup Yep, yep, and yeah, I wondered yeah, yeah, yeah. where that exuberance was coming from. Well, you know, again, like, this is one of those things where, like, I had this part of the song that did this rave-up thing, and at first I was thinking of it in terms of, like, Velvet Underground, like, when they would do those things that started slow and got faster and yeah. faster. And I love that, and I was maybe, again, like, listening a lot to the Velvets at that moment. And um, and then, like, when Raul got a hold of it, he added these rhythmic figures in there that... Mm -hmm. You know, they reminded me of flamenco or something mm. like that. They took it and put it into this whole other place. So, uh, yeah, so we worked on, we call them the rave up sections where I'm doing the yup yups and uh, it's getting faster and faster. And almost like when he added his acoustic guitar part, it almost had this kind of like flamenco style. You right. could feel like, you know, guys clapping their hands and stomping totally, their boot yeah. heels and yeah. stuff. And, um, you know, so it just took on its own shape in the studio, which was really interesting. And, uh, you know, 
anyway, it seemed like a good way to start the record. I think it is something something strange, and it kind of uh, encapsulate the whole the the record to come. Like, yeah, it really, it's, yeah. it's one of those. And you songs. know, it's a song that's got a lot of sampled sound. It's got real yeah. sounds. It doesn't have any drums actually on it. Oh, but it um, has a lot of percussion stuff and a lot of electronic percussion. You know, that's the other funny thing about this record. A lot of uh, a lot of different people play on it, from Nels Klein, Sharon Van Etten sings on six songs, you know, all the guys from The Dust, Steve Shelley, Alan Lick, Tim Lunsell, mm-hmm. and uh, Kid Millions from Oneida plays drums on some stuff. And really, He's a what good it, man, that Kid Millions. Yeah, he is. He's <laughs> awesome. He's kind of a, one of my new friends, and it was really cool to have him play on the record. I think one thing that Raul wanted from this record is... He wanted it not. He wanted it to sound even further from like a Sonic Youth arrangement and Sonic Youth band setup than ever before. Like he wanted me to branch out and and, and he wanted to hear like you know he still wanted to keep all my electric guitarisms and yeah, things yeah, like that. Yeah. But he wanted to see me branch out into some different stuff. So we made kind of conscious efforts. Like you know Steve is not the only drummer on this record. After drumming on my last three records if you count Acoustic Dust and you know and of course all the records with Sonic Youth Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different people playing on this record and everybody that played on it played on it in the course of like you know two or three days maybe Alan came in a bunch more days than that because he was a little more integrally involved but yeah by the time we got to mixing, it was like there were songs where like Steve played down the whole song and Kid played down the whole song and maybe there were a couple where I played some drums or Raul played drums mm-hmm. or we had electronic drums. And when we went to mix, the only criteria was what's the best thing for this song, you know? So it was almost like at this point, I can't even tell you for some of the songs, like who's playing drums on the chorus of that song? And there's songs where it's like Steve Shelley's playing drums on the first chorus and Kid Millions is playing drums on the second chorus and it's electronic drums on the bridge and maybe it's me playing the cymbals on the outro and you know it, it just all became studio material yeah. which was really interesting yeah. so it was there yeah. was kind of like we got rid of uh, any egotistical aspect of like oh you know Nels played on eight songs we got to put we got to have Nels in the mix on eight mm-hmm. songs like it wasn't like that at all it was like well here's Nels' lead in this section, does that make the song better? Or like, here's what Alan did, here's what Lee did on oh, electric guitar. And, you know, so like, really every song was like an uncovery and discovery process of like, what's going to be the best thing for this song, right. you know? And that was, that made it really fun. Yeah. Well, speaking of fun and potentially horrifying songs, let's move <laughs> on to Uncle Skeleton. Uncle Skeleton. We're coming in for a landing. All right, here we go. You have to shake the flesh off to open up the body's door. You have to let the skeleton breathe. That's the thing the skeleton's for. So use a scalpel, use a knife, shuck the flesh off in a pile. You need to keep the skeleton entertained. You gotta make skeleton smile well you know this is one of the last songs we developed for the record and I had this song this tune and I really loved the tune and I was thinking of it in terms of like a like I kept thinking like this could be like my hippie cowboy western you know i was thinking i was listening to this i found this version of joni mitchell doing papa john phillips song me and my uncle which like you know the grateful dead played it a lot and made it kind of famous but a lot of people have played that song and i I heard this joni mitchell version of the song and i really loved it and um i had this tune and i was like yeah this is a song like that i want this to be kind of like a western Mm. you know it felt like that from the from the sound of the song to me and we were working on it and we struggled with it for a while and then finally we got the music to be really nice we really loved the music and yet i didn't have any lyrics for it i had a chorus and i didn't have any verses at all and raul was like we were getting to the end he was like we got to start mixing like if if nothing happens vocally with this song now you know we're going to leave it behind and it was also this song where like we started with like real drums and then he put this electronic drum that almost had this like disco beat and we almost we didn't come to blows, but we had arguments <laughs> about it in the studio because I was like, man, I can't relate to that. It was like really just like a like an electronic disco beat. Right. And, and like he was insistent. He was like, this is great. Like, you got to trust me on this one. And in the end, I did trust him. And I and, you know, our, our moments of tension in the studio in almost every case made 
what we did better and right. stronger, sure. you know? And that's that's a good sign of a true collaborator. But anyway, so we, we had this song. And, you know, like I said, there were songs where I sent Jonathan uh, demos or I sent him lyric sheets with just three lines filled in and he came back. And for this song, I had nothing. But sometimes Jonathan just sent me lyrics and he sent me this lyric sheet early on and it was called Let the Skeleton Breathe. And like I read these lyrics over like months before we ended up using this and I was just like, this is the weirdest bunch it's of lyrics. Like you said, like about scalpels and cutting people open and skin. I was like, this is this is not my thing. It doesn't seem like, like a thing you would do. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just put it in my folder. You know, I was like, okay, whatever. This is not going to work. This one's not going to work, you know. <laughs> and then like in these days... Um, these last days when Raul was like, you gotta, you know, if you don't have verses for this song, we're gonna leave it behind. We'll do it for the next record or whatever. Yeah. I was like, all right, let me try something. And I pulled this sheet of Jonathan's and I was like, these are such freaking weird lyrics. <laughs> let me just go out and try these. And like, I went out into this studio to the microphone and like, I started singing them and like every line just kind of like fell into place. Like I didn't have to do anything. It was really kind of uncanny. Like it gave me chills. It was like huh. I started with the first line and like the tune was there and it was just like every line like fell right into place. I was like, wow, this is really bizarre, yeah, you know? Yeah. And like I had these choruses that were ostensibly about this woman named Lauren and like his lyrics were about skeletons and cutting people open and stuff. And like they didn't go together at all. And so I wrote to Jonathan and said, like, wow, your, your lyrics that I thought were not going to be good at all, like, work perfectly, but <laughs> they don't really fit with my chorus. And, like, what should we do? And, like, we went back and forth on it for a while. And then finally he said, you know, they don't have to relate to each other. They're in the same song. Somehow they mean something together and they work really good. Don't overthink it. You know, the, it's, the chorus sounds good. The verses sound good. Just leave it, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't until later, actually, when I was hearing him being interviewed in that feature film I was telling you about, he's talking about how uh, he wrote those lyrics when he was working on the book that is his current novel called A Gambler's Anatomy. And the book is about a gambler. I haven't read it yet, so I only can know I only know the story a little bit from what I've heard. But it's about a gambler. And at some point he has some weird uh, operation where mm. they they dig out his skeleton or I, I, I don't know I don't know what what it exactly goes on but the lyrics were taken right from the pages of his most recent oh, book and I, I didn't see. know okay. that at all at the time that was kind of a later kind of oh that's a fun fact that you know they <laughs> right out of Jonathan's new book but somehow it just worked and you know it became this kind of Western in a way and we put in some lines about like dealing out the cards and you know some things to give it a little bit more of a Western edge and then in the last verse there's this chorus of voices doing what we call the Morricone vo mm -hmm, voices, where mm -hmm. they're doing like the spaghetti western, oh, <laughs> you know, like like one of those uh, Morricone, yeah. you know, good, the bad, and the ugly right, song things. Right. And so, you know, it became my like, you know, my hippie country western <laughs> song, and it's with a disco beat, right? And, you know. Well, it's great. It's cool. It's uh, one of my favorite tracks on the record. I'm really hoping that at some point Mute will do something with it, like make a video for it or something like that. Why Uncle Skeleton? Um, well, I guess partly because, you know, before we had a title for it, I kept saying, like, this is my me and my uncle song. And, and then he oh. had this song, Let the Skeleton Breathe. And I didn't like Let the Skeleton Breathe. So for a while we abbreviated it. We just put the two together and called it Uncle Skeleton. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll change that name later, <laughs> you know. And then when it came time, it was like, you know, everybody else was like, no, Uncle Skeleton sounds great. Just it's, leave, it's, leave it at it's, that, it's, you know. Okay. So again, it like suits a lot of, it. this record had a lot of like weird happenstance and chance that just came, you know, like the story about losing the phone on the train yeah you yeah know? like a lot of this stuff found its way into mm. you know into the song in very kind of playful creative ways which which i really enjoyed yeah yeah the spirit of that is there for yeah. sure let's start again is the next yeah. song let's start again let's make it over let's tip the cup and watch it run out
mean, I know you're a dad. I know you have a long history of playing music with people. Yeah. I thought of both of those things as I listen to this song. It, it sounds to me like, and you know, obviously you can dispel all of these things as yeah. you go on, but it sounded to me like a father talking to a, a child. It, it sounded to me like a friend trying to reconnect with old friends they hadn't seen in a while. These are the things that went through my mind listening to this song. Yeah, I think I think some of that was there. Maybe some of the, the like, connecting... Because in the period when I was writing this, I was connecting with a couple people I hadn't heard from in many, many years and uh-huh. kind of being excited to see where people had gone and what pe- where people had ended up and stuff. And I guess I was also thinking about it in terms of, like, let's start again, like, you know, about a relationship that maybe gets to a point where you want to back up and sort of replay the last month or year or whatever it is and, and playing it like that. But mostly, you know, it's it's one of the few songs I've ever played piano rather than guitar on and it oh. started with me sitting at a piano with a little cassette recorder going or something or probably my iPhone actually and playing these chords on the piano and and it was kind of like a conceptual exercise because I was working with um, like every chord kind of sh- keeps one or two fingers the same and shifts one note you know, from one chord to the next so you can oh, almost play this song without moving your hand very much and I, I played it on piano very, very crudely and then played it for Raul and he really liked it. And so we spent a while getting me to play it better. And uh, I think it's maybe one of the few times I've ever recorded a song on piano. Oh. And like now when I play this song in concert, he plays the piano part and I play guitar on it or I play it on guitar by myself if I'm doing a solo show. But um, I really loved the feel of it being a piano song. And, mm-hmm. and while I was playing the initial chords, that was the, the one line that just came to me. Let's start again. Let's make it over. And like that was the, the only line I had for a while. And I just kind of built it up conceptually from that, thinking, it, you know, loosely free associating with a bunch of other stuff. And this is one that Jonathan did not help on. And I kind of just built it all up, uh, you know, in this strange way. And... And this is another one of these songs where, like, it's got a very, uh, you know, it's got a piano-based front and back, and then it's got this really weird middle with these kind of, like, uh, electronic drum sounds and what they call trap snare these days, you know, what the the rap kids use (laughs) called trap, and, like, all this stuff that Raul brought to it. And so it has this crazy, like, synthetic middle. Right. And then it's got this kind of big finale with lots of layered voices, a lot of Sharon Van Etten's voice and a lot of my voices and probably Raul's voice in there, too. And, you know, it became this kind of interesting production number. And it just had a really cool vibe right from the start. And I didn't overthink the lyrics too much on this one. I just kind of wrote them all out. You know, there's Let's Start Again Now That You're Older. So maybe that part was referencing, like, a, you know, seeing children grow up. I don't know. This is like my, that. again, this is my yeah. reading. Yeah. I don't, know I don't think there's anything too specific about it. Yeah. It was more like being a songwriter and free associating lyrics to make the song work in a way. And, um, you know, there's always an ulterior motive behind whatever you're right you know or a subconscious if, mode yeah, motive subconscious, yeah. yes uh, not ulterior more like a subconscious <laughs> motive yeah, yeah there, there always is um, well because as you're talking about the process being new and, and reinvigorating for you in a lot mm-hmm. of ways this is another song of many I think on the record where it seems to me that you're in a reflective mode yeah like also yeah. just taking stock a little bit yeah and again I could be misinterpreted and now that you mentioned that Jonathan Jonathan's hands are on some of these words. I actually don't know if that's the case. And, yeah, actually, uh, his hands are not on the words in this one. Okay, this one is yeah, just all no, me. no, no. I mean, on the record oh, as yeah. a whole. Oh yeah, 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 so yeah. So I'm yeah. trying to. It's it's fascinating to try to pin down intent. Yeah. When you have the process you've had with this record. Yeah, it's true because it took a long time to gestate because you know we worked on it over the course of a year, but that's because Raul was coming and going from mm-hmm. Spain. So, you know, we probably worked on it for four and a half months or something like that, mm-hmm. which is still a pretty long time. Uh, but, you know, also what was amazing is, like, in this day and age, it's it's kind of strange. And, I mean, unless you're, you know, Taylor Swift or somebody, I'm like, who works on a record for a year? You know, it's kind of like... And then it took most of a year to come out, I, I must say. it's it's It was done almost a year ago that it's finally coming out now. But... You know, it's funny to work on a record for a year when these days, you know, people listen to a record for a week. Yeah. And then they go on to they the next on. week's batch of yeah. records. You know, Pitchfork is kind of emblematic of that in a way of like, here's this week's new records. And you know, everybody turns to them and forgets last week's yeah. old, re- then old records, you know. And so this song for me 
I mean, I think one of the things I got out of the lyrical thing was let's start again. Like it was emblematic of the whole process. Oh, I see. You know, and then for me, like for a while, I was opening my concerts with this when I started doing all this material. And it was like, let's start again, meaning like, OK, this is a new batch of Lee songs that are going to be presented in a new way. I, I was presenting a lot of them as a solo acoustic, so, you know, troubadour kind of situation. And either that or even with the band, like we're presenting, this is a new presentation. It's not a two guitar, bass and drums band. And so I like the idea of Let's Start Again on that level too, that it was kind of, uh, it kind of stood in for, you know, what this whole record was in a way, like a whole new beginning. You know, I'm 60, 61 or whatever. And, you know, to start a new track at this point is it's pretty exciting just because right now so many things are clicking in my life my visual art is in an amazing place and this record to me was just an amazing experience yeah. and so you know it's funny to have this whole long career behind me but still be you know i'm happy to be really excited about what's yeah. going on right now i yeah. mean that's you know not everybody can say that about what they're doing at the moment so you know let's start again felt like a good uh, good i don't know catch-all umbrella for the whole project okay. in a way. Okay. All right, cool. We're going to move on now to Last Looks, yeah. which features a, a prominent Sharon Van Etten vocal. I recall uh, you start reciting poetry in the middle of yes. this thing. We were talking about something spoken between us. We were smoking and joking and out of our heads. We were running around corners, laying out in the street, and raising some hell in town. So run downtown, leave your shoes behind. Step out of the wet grass into a new state of mind. You're gonna open up off the cuff, open up and say hello. This is a two-part song. It's a slow language part with, with Sharon duetting with me. Yes. And this was another thing where, like Raul said, like, you know, when we were getting Sharon to come in, he was like, I think we should let Sharon try every other verse here and do a duet with you. And I was like, at first I was taken aback because it hadn't occurred to me mm -hmm. but it was such a good idea and like the ambience on this song both both halves of it but the, especially the slow part where we're trading verses it's like it's like nothing else on the record and one thing I love about this record is almost every song is very individual yeah, and yeah, different yeah. and doesn't yeah. sound like the other ones yeah for sure and the idea of us trading verses and doing this duet was you know I've always loved singing with a female voice and uh, it was a really good idea and it, it worked out really really well and it's it's again, you know, this song is dedicated, there's a couple initials on the lyric sheet, it's dedicated to uh, a kind of a guy younger than me and a guy much older than me who both kind of passed away in the months before I wrote this song. Hmm. And I was, uh, you know, I worked, maybe you knew this, but I worked uh, last year in 2016 on this TV show called Vinyl. Yeah, yeah, Martin yeah. Martin Scorsese yeah, of course. and Mick Jagger yeah. show. And it was, you know, it wasn't a great show, sadly, and it didn't continue. But for me, it was an amazing experience. And I think everything we did musically was really fun. Like uh, Mick's son, Jimmy Jagger, played this like singer in a yes. punk band. And so me and Don Fleming produced all the music that you heard on screen when his band was playing right. and, and produced him singing and all that stuff. And we also produced the music that you heard when you saw The Velvet Underground or Alice Cooper or Lou Reed or, you know, a lot of the special uh, stars that were you know included on the show right and we had a blast and one of the really interesting things about working on the show was whenever we did music they would want us to be on the set when that music was being played so we were like the authority figures saying like yes it sounds right or no the amps don't look right or you know like when they were filming like Lou Reed's band like no Steve Hunter wouldn't have had a Les Paul he would have had a Telecaster and it would have been yellow or you know those kind Creative of things. Creative consultant kind yeah. of work yeah. Yeah so we yeah. did a lot of historical research to make the bands look right and to make them sound right and mm -hmm. got to work with an amazing group of people. We did a song with Iggy, we did a song with Alison Mosshart, John Doe, we had the guys from Blue Oyster Cult playing backing on songs, and oh, wow. uh, Ross the Boss from The Dictators on a song, and all these different people. It was a super fun process. 
But we got to be on the set a lot, and the set was crazy. Sometimes when they were filming, like, you know, scenes in a rock club, there'd be, like, 150 extras in, like, period costume yeah. from late 60s, early 70s, and, and there'd be a crew of about 150 people, too, like, all of these crazy people. And they'd all be gathered around, and you'd sit there for hours while they were getting ready. And then right before they started a film, they would, somebody would call out last looks, and, like, and then somebody else would call it again until everybody heard it. And that was the time when, like all the fashion people and the makeup people could do their last little tweaks and we could last say like looks, oh huh? you know the microphone is not in the right you know we do everybody did their last minute touches right before oh. they rolled the camera okay and that's what they called last looks and i guess it's a common term I on set i never heard that term yeah me neither yeah. but i really liked the phrase and at the time i heard it i was thinking about these two guys that passed one like a musician friend and one an older relative an italian guy from italy that was married to my cousin that were both really special people and mm. both died in like kind of interesting and heartfelt ways and um and i thought well last looks this could be a you know this this you know i just kind of repurposed the title to be talking about these guys and and uh and then wrote this song that was in two parts and the first part is like you know you know leave today and sail away into the trees and it's kind of like you know like you know romantically poetic and the second part is more like you know you're walking on the streets of this town it's this spoken word thing and like you know okay okay like leave your shoes at the edge of the grass hop over the fence and just run away off through the field and you know we'll meet downtown under the flashing lights and all this stuff and kind of like two different takes on you know one more like a send-off like when you yeah. can see kind of like like almost like uh I don't know, in that movie Dead Man where they're burying the Indian brave and they put him in the canoe and like yeah, push yeah, it yeah. off, you know, like like that Last kind looks. of a send yeah. off. And mm -hmm. the other half being more this like either flashback to what our lives were like when we were alive and kicking, you know, under the flashing lights downtown, drinking and getting getting crazy and, ra right. crazy and raising hell in town and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I had these two, two different parts to it. Right. I want to ask you a potentially strange question, but uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Sonic Youth record, Washing Machine. Yeah, me too. And yeah, <laughs> I, I, th I think it's wonderful. And you have a song on, on the record called uh, Skip Tracer. Yeah. This she did in public for us to see. She came in here too drunk to do the show. Between the trains and cars, broken glass and lost hubcaps, images of a gun. Row house, row house, pass up to fill the screen clothes flung out of closets doorknobs falling off for whatever reason that song uh is always with me yeah i can just be wandering around song. and it just everything about it like the, your delivery and i just start singing it to myself it's one of those songs that's in my head i'm glad to hear it yeah and and this record as i was listening to it it reminded me of to ask you this do you have a particular fascination with the word hello? I know this seems weird, but... Well, you know, the title of the feature film is Hello, 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 oh, Lee Ronaldo, Electric it? Trim. Is it? Okay. Yeah. And partly because of that, this song, Last Looks, which has all the hellos at the end. And I believe but, they show up again. I believe it's in Thrown Over the Wall, maybe. I don't remember the... Uh, well, oh, maybe, yes, it is. Yeah. It is in Thrown Over the Wall yeah. as well. There's, there's a know, couple hellos know, in, that recur yeah, with you. Yeah. And, I, and it's, Hello 2015 and yeah, Skip Tracer. That's what the, I mean. That's why I... Yeah. yeah, there's something about that. It's obviously a very welcoming word. Yeah, but I guess you, so. You, you know, people have, you know, I remember <laughs> reading this article once about 
people did this analysis of Springsteen and like totaled up like how many times he used the word cars or girls or highway or road. Mary you know, or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe it's one of those things. But kind of in the last part of Last Looks, I was using hello as like kind of like talking across the great divide at the, the person, these two people that were gone, you know, like I was using it in that sense of like, can you hear me? You know, it's time you leave and time I go and, you know, all this stuff. And I don't know, again, like, you know, one of the funny things about this record was, you know, I'm one of these people that puts off finalizing lyrics or even writing lyrics as long as possible. And like I was explaining, explaining earlier, you know, Sonic Youth's process was always like, leave the lyrics till the last minute, yeah. leave them till the end. And so this record was like that. And at a certain point with every song, Raul was like, okay, we need a vocal next. And I would be like, I'm not ready. I don't have a vocal. And he would be like, I don't care. You got to go sing something. I need to know where the vocals are going to be and oh, what, they, right. what the melody is going to sure, be like. Sure. And so he would force me to go out there and sing stuff. And in a lot of these cases, uh, you know, I had an idea what I wanted it to be about, but I didn't have a lot written down. And I would just go out and, and, and extemporize. Sure. And a lot of lyrics for this song in particular, the hellos all came just by like I needed to say something there. And that's the first thing that came into my head. And then I started like, you know, we did a bunch of takes and I was refining it a little bit. But the whole spoken dialogue at the end, like, you know, so we were talking about something spoken here, something we were smoking, smoking and joking. joking. Yeah, you know, it all like I just did all that off the cuff, and then uh. later like modified it and kind of finalized it a little bit more, and uh, and so in a way, his forcing me to do vocals led to a lot of vocals that we kept in a, in a weird right. way, you know. Right. I, don't I was know. thinking about. Yeah. Um, you know, when the Beatles were working on Hey Jude, you know, Paul had this line, the movement you need is on your shoulder. And he was like, oh, I'll, I'll fix that later. And John was like, no, that's one of the greatest lines in the song. And convinced Paul to keep that line right. in the song, even though on the surface it didn't really mean anything, you know. But uh, to John it was like, it means something. You just don't know what it means yet. Yeah, you know? and yeah. So we trusted ourselves a lot on this record. I, I got a lot of stuff just by extemporizing in front of the microphone and then later refining it a little bit or sending those things to Jonathan and having him refine them too, you know? And so Last Looks was one of those songs that had okay. a lot of uh, a lot of words in the second half like that. If you and I were on a university campus, yeah, <laughs> I would suggest that uh, my deep reading of your interest in the word hello speaks to some <laughs> communica communication thing that's happening on this record too. I do really feel that about this record. You're really talking... I think, from what I can tell, about how we communicate, what we use to communicate. Yep. Yep. And I, I do think those hellos that you send off into the distance, I believe in Thrown Over the Wall, you actually kind of describe what the cadence of saying hello yeah. is even like. You know, yeah. it's high, it's low. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, again, I, I will work I on my good. thesis. No, I think it's good. <laughs> and I think that there was a certain amount of, you know, I really wanted this record to communicate and I wanted to feel like we were making a record that a lot of people would hear, you yeah. know? And I yeah. felt, I feel like it's some of my best work and my best singing. And, and I must say, the, you know, Raul was really keen on getting me to do good vocals when we did that Acoustic Dust record. I think... You know, he liked what we were doing, and then we did the vocals at the end in his little home studio, and he was like, wow, I really love how you sing. Like, then, that's when he said, like, I'd love to work on a new project with oh, you. Okay. And I think his interest was partly because he liked... My, he's, he's really a good producer with vocalists, like working with these flamenco women. Like, it's all yeah. about the vocals, and yeah. he's really good at that. And, and I think he liked something about the way I sang. And so we knew we were going to concentrate on the vocals a lot on this record and try and make them as good as possible. And I feel really good about them and these days when i'm performing like the vocal is the first thing i'm thinking about like yeah, the guitar work yeah. is second on, the, on you know to my performances now and and that's kind of a shift from being mostly a guitar player who sang to now being a singer who plays guitar you know and um well you're a wonderful singer if i might say oh, and, thanks. and i think that your exploration of your voice on this record is is really notable and yeah. i i suppose raul we, is we worked a lot on it yeah. and we you know we did vocals again and again just trying to get you know it, it takes a while to get comfortable singing in the studio and then yeah uh and then singing as though you've been singing the song for months and and really are inside of it you know that's a, that's a kind of a special skill and it took us a while like, to do that so yeah um we really concentrated on it a lot we're going to move on to the next song uh, on the record, which I believe is called Circular... Circular Right as Rain. Circular Right yeah. as Rain. Now, this song, yeah. you mentioned the Beatles there. These little uh, instrumental builds reminded me a little bit of A Day in the Life. Huh.
just they're very they're very quick. Yeah, they're very quick, but <laughs> they, they they do that kind of similar thing where yeah. it's like a repeated motif like that. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that's just one thing that's obviously there's a lot going on in this song. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that, this is, you know, probably it's, I think it's the shortest song and the most pop song on yes. the record, maybe next to Uncle Skeleton. But, um, you know, this song was written, I mean, there's, there's a bunch, each verse kind of takes it in a different place, but it was written, you know, there was a lot of stuff on this record that was, you know, this record was written during the last election cycle and yeah. mostly be you know and written and completed before Trump was elected but there was a lot of political stuff on my mind during the period when we wrote this record and this song has a little bit of that the last verse talks about like you know you're sitting at your breakfast table you're reading the paper it's all false news and false dawns and you know the same old shit basically yeah. you know and um, and the first verse is kind of about a I don't know, an affair, uh, an affair or a romantic encounter or something like that where, you know, it's about, you, you sort of think in those situations sometimes that you've got the other person pegged and you almost like own them, but mm -hmm. they've got their own, they've got a view of their own of the situation, you know? And, uh, and the second verse is yeah, all of, also about like, you know, you wake up, you're starting your day, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're doing the same things you did the day before. Sir, I, I, I introduced this song saying that the song is about those kind of routines that we find that we go through in our daily life. Like you get up, you make your coffee, you go to work, or you do whatever you do in the morning. You Wait a minute. Your, Are yeah. you saying the lyrics and the music both have something to do possibly with a day in the life? Um, well, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I didn't think about it in that regard You're before. You're talking about the newspapers. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, that's true. I read the news today. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of weird connections. And, you know, I wasn't thinking about that song at all sure, when making no, I'm this sorry song. But this I've been it. obsessed with, uh, since that Sgt. Pepper reissue deluxe came out like a couple of weeks or months ago, yeah. I've been listening to all those. You know, the Beatles are finally opening their vault and, like, releasing a lot of you know alternate takes and you know they've obviously got tons of stuff in yeah. their vaults and like there's great uh takes of a day in the life from john's early acoustic demo to what they did with it and those those uh sections you're talking about where you hear their friend mal evans counting yes. one through 24 as they you know to mark the time with the alarm clock and everything do the, yeah, yeah 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 it's it's like you know that's you know, those are the kind of recording situations we were working on on this record. And actually, there's a place in Thrown Over the Wall where we had a section where we knew we were going to have a buildup of some sort and we didn't know what it was. And we yeah. just, in the computer, we laid out the place and we said, like, all right, something's going to go in here later. You yeah, know, in yeah. very similar fashion, you right. know. But um, anyway, I don't mean to throw you off. Maybe I, I, this whole Beatles angle is wrong, but I no, and that's a kind of a Beatles. People have said that's a Beatlesy song, and like when you get to the bridge section in the middle, when you gaze out on your city, we always called that the Beach Boys section right. because it opens up into one of those pet sounds totally, sections yeah. with like you know bell trees and like lots of harmony mm -hmm. voices and stuff. And again, you know, we weren't trying to, you know, one thing without mentioning any names, there's a lot of young groups these days that are mining, especially what the Beach Boys did in that period, which I'm kind of amazed of and doing like very similar harmonies to what the Beach Boys were doing in that period. And, you know, I listen to that stuff and, and I'm like, yeah, this is great. You know, I'd rather hear the original than right. hear you doing the ape, you know, or like in that period in the late 90s when, again, without mentioning names, <laughs> bands were doing like punk music, like reinterpreting the clash and all that yeah. the jam and stuff like that and it was like all right but you know make it your own rather than just try you know like they missed out on it so they wanted to do yeah, it again sure. i understand all that sure. but you know i don't need that having been there in those days um 
So we were we were inspired by the way they made those records, but we were never trying to imitate the. Oh kind no, of I don't sounds. think you were. Yeah, yeah no, I'm no. just I'm just saying that on my own. <laughs> but you know, so this record to me, this song to me was about the kind of routines that you go through in your your life. I kept thinking, like I kept waking up thinking, like, oh, I have the same thing for breakfast every day. I'm tired of it, and then I do this, and I'm tired of it, and then yeah. you know, like at the end of the day, you do this, and you you know, you look at your phone and put it on your bedstead and go to sleep, and you get up the next morning, you kind of do the same damn yeah like. And I was, I was kind of freaking out personally, <laughs> thinking like, "Wow, am I so deep into my routine that I can't bust out of it and have a unique experience?" And, you know, unique experiences are kind of where you find them and where you let yourself be open to them. And yeah. I think, I think in a way, that's what this song was about. It was about, you know, or you live with someone long enough, you think you own them, you think you've got them pegged, but then no, they've got their own viewpoint on it, and they'll they'll throw a curveball, and something else will happen, or. You know, you uh, you wake up in the morning and you want to do something different than your normal routine, and so I, I mean, I think I was I thinking okay. about I, I was thinking about that in, in not being judgmental about other people, but in terms of my own life, feeling like oh, you know, it's easy to get stuck in ruts, and how do you knock yourself out of it? Right. And in a way, this record, the whole process of making it was getting out of a rut. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Putting yourself in an odd new situation every day where you don't know what's going to happen, but it was super exciting and interesting. So. Okay, that that's cool. I didn't. I'll have to re-listen to that. Yeah, that, that really shed some light on it. Okay, we're gonna go to the title track now. Oh yeah, electric trim. Yeah. Down again on a postcard. In a frame. Well, are you scared? I mean, I really, I, it seems to be about our cultural moment in terms of, uh, I, I don't know, various people interfering with other people's relationships. Yep, yep. There's, are you fr- uh, scared of a woman's love, scared of a man's love, scared yeah. of a human love? A lot of those lines are Jonathan's. This is one of these songs where I had like four lines, hmm. and then he filled in almost every line, and then we passed it back and forth for another like two months, just redlining stuff we didn't like or that didn't work, and really honing it in. It was a really fun process. And um, this is one of those songs, I tend to write songs where like I'll come up with a million parts that could go and they then they end up being like almost like sweet like you know yeah like, yeah like uh, s u i t e sweet <laughs> um, and this is one of those songs that has a lot of different parts and 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 we really loved working on this song in the studio because we were able to treat some of these different parts in different ways like uh-huh. so there's one part where you, you really hear Nell's like kicking out the rock leads where we called it the wings part where it's like a really almost like a parody of a classic rock right. uh, you know riff and, and section where it's really the band is kicked into gear and rocking as hard as they can be and then you have these two choruses are you scared of a woman's love yeah. which I was inspired by an old crazy disco song by Maxine Nightingale and the song is called Right Back Where You Belong and it's come on where you started from oh, yeah, you this... gotta get right back where you started from right. love is strong and like that's that's the blueprint for the choruses of this song and every time we came to it before I had lyrics I would I would burst <laughs> into that song and you know so th- and then it has a like a new music section we called it that has like prepared piano and all these like plinks and plunks and like very strange sounding like outer spacey things and um and it starts and ends with this very dark like dark windy sound electronic wind sound coming through and these verses about like you know puppets talk in different voices and you know the weak cling hardest to the shittiest raft and this was jonathan kind of writing about our cultural moment and you know so the ver- the choruses are a little bit about you know man love woman love people love you know saying like you know all of that is good and like not trying to put a damper on anybody's love of any other you know gender person uh but there's there's some stuff that's 
a little more political or a little less political. I mean, the end verse is about stumbling around in the night in a park and not being afraid to fall on your bum in the dark and all this, you know, again, like really weird lyrics, like, uh, you know, I, that was my rough line, not afraid of landing on your bum in the dark. And like, you know, bum is like an English expression. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Never, yeah. We never say bum in the States. And again, this was one of those places where I was like, I'll change that later. And then like Roll was like, I really like that, you know, yeah. and, and we left it. But it's one of those episodic songs that goes through a lot of different changes. Right. It starts and ends with this kind of spooky thing and then has these, you know, uplifting rock sections in the middle and, and different things. So it's it's um It's the title track too. It's, it's the title track and that came about in a very weird way in that like I was demoing all this stuff in an acoustic format and at some point I made a demo of this song where I added electric guitar and so I put at the end of the file name, it didn't have a name yet, but I put electric you know, whatever the song was called. It was probably just called like F F C G C C or the whatever the tuning was. Yeah, right. And then it said, you know, electric, you know. And, and then later I edited it and I wrote the word trim after electric. And so it, was, it said electric trim on the thing. And then when Jonathan filled out all the lyrics, he was calling it human love. And I loved the lyrics, but I didn't like the title Human Love because it sounded a little namby-pamby or something to me. <laughs> and so I was like, hey, Jonathan, how about even though it's not referenced in the song or anything, how about we call it Electric Trim? I mean, I just like that phrase somehow better than Human Love. And then we were working on the bass parts, and my bass player, Tim Luntzel, said, well, you know what trim is, don't you? Yeah. And I was like, no, what do you mean? You know, I had no idea. And he was like, well, it's slang for, you know, uh -huh. woman's genitals, uh -huh. or we, as we say, pussy. I don't know if you can say that. You can that say that. Air. Sure, you can he say was that. Like, you know, it's slang for you pussy. You already said trim, so. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. See, I didn't know what trim <laughs> yeah, meant. Yeah, I knew what so it I meant. I had no preconception of what this song title meant. And all of a sudden, it was like, well, electric trim, you know rock and roll like sex in a rock and roll context is electric and so like uh -huh. and, and and in the context of this of this song that's talking about you know men and women and i mean i felt like wow this song title really well, works that's what you i know, thought another, of yeah you know another <laughs> odd happenstance and right. then yeah and then when it came when i was looking at, for a cover image for the record you know i had this image that i found on a friend of mine's instagram and i was like this is a great image this is a, kind of a well-known person and I was like, this is going to be my cover image. And like, I downloaded it and I, I, I was playing around with type on it. And like, no one I showed this image to liked it at all. Everybody oh. was like, that's not your album cover, dude. Get real. <laughs> and I was like, I really love it. And like, nobody did. And so finally, I was convinced I had to find another image. And I started looking around and and I saw this picture of Richard Prince's tire tracks on a, on a country lane. Yeah, and the I skid marks, yeah. Like, wow, somehow that's that said electric trim to me. It was mm. like those tire marks said like rock and roll and sex in the back of a car or something. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, this is this is the perfect cover for, for the record. Um, well, fascinatingly, as I look at the cover now, it also looks like an accident. Well, yeah, it looks an, like an accident. An accident, accident. Seed. Yeah, I didn't think about that so much. I really thought more of it was like, you know, people goofing around on a country lane or something like that because there is no well, I, car or anything i didn't mean it in a dark way i think yeah. just given the happenstance you you uh you know lent, you just basically let happenstance take over this process more yeah. for you happy yeah. accidents as yeah. you say and you know they're happy accidents and they mean something it's just you don't always know they mean something and sometimes you have to have the confidence to let those question mark things exist yeah and not try and think through everything to be you know i tend to try and think everything through to death whether it's lyrics or you know almost everything in life yeah and you know in this case it was like okay you know let's let poetry take over yes. here and just say like we like it we don't know why but there's something that works about it you know human love didn't work electric trim worked and then all of a sudden electric trim got piled high with reasons why it works yes. that were not intended you know <laughs> so uh you know it was good yeah no it it's good. it's great it's a great song we're gonna move on now to uh purloined you got solitude and gray skies too a fire in your eye but you're still lonely and asleep just like the last time you got stolen dreams and broken schemes you still just one string shy crystal words and painted birds don't help at all this is a, a fascinating song i feel like there's 
regret in it. It's uh, maybe a frustration with a lack of foresight, maybe. Uh, yeah. That's my reading. Well, you know, this is one of these songs where we had we had a lot of the music done, and we were really loving the music. It starts with this weird chord progression I made up on this old battered 12-string guitar that was missing a couple strings, and then it starts with like a kind of an almost electronic section. A lot of stuff's going on in a kind of ambient way with a thrusting beat with, you know, without any singing for a while. And like, I didn't really have any words for this song. And Jonathan sent me these four lines. And, and like, I didn't, again, I didn't find this out till later till I heard him interviewed for the movie. And he was like, yeah, those four lines that became the chorus of Purloined, you know, like, those four lines based on Edgar Allan Post, you know, these two Edgar Allan Post stories, the purloined letter and the telltale heart. Oh. He was like, those four lines have been kicking around in my desk drawer for 20 years. And like I keep shuffle, I keep looking at it and going like, man, this is great. This is something good. I don't know what it is, you know, and like putting it back in a drawer and like a year later finding it again. And he tells this funny story about like how it was kicking around in his drawer for like 15 or 20 years. And he was like, but it didn't mean anything until I sent it to Lee and all of a sudden it meant something, you know, when he used it in this song. And mm -hmm. like, I went out there with those songs and again, like those songs fit almost perfectly into the chorus. I changed it a little bit from what he sent me, but once the chorus was locked in, I don't know, somehow I kind of free associated from there and just worked out these verses. And, you know, it has a kind of a dark edge to it, that song. And uh, it's talking about, you know, I forget what your interpretation was. Well, but this notion of uh, shouldn't we have known better, I believe, is, yeah. is what comes yeah. up. It's this notion yeah. of we should have seen this coming. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know what this is yeah. in this context. Yeah. It's very I mysterious. Went, this story. Yeah. and this I was like, you note. got solitude, you got gray skies, yeah. you got you know subway scenes and magazines, and it was kind of just like free associating like all the random things that go on in life, and mm -hmm. sometimes you're kind of surrounded by heaps of baloney and bullshit or whatever, you know, and you just are trying to claw your way out of it. And this song had a little bit of that going on with it. It was just like kind of trying to use language to to just uh, indicate like all the things you know again like we're going to talk about new thing and that's a song about yeah. the internet and this song was kind of like about all the assaultive things you get hit with in your day to day life and like how you make sense of it and you know sometimes they almost you know it's almost like there's a secret letter that's what the chorus is all yeah. about you yeah. know you know we should have known better the the stolen note the telltale heart the purloined letter and you know it's it's got a kind of mystery to it that I didn't try and crack the code of but I tried to add to the mystery of the chorus with the way I structured the, yeah. ly the lyrics in yeah. the verse. Okay, no, it's cool. Uh, I like this one a lot. Yeah. All right, we're almost uh, towards the end here. We're going to yeah, go to two more. Two more. <laughs> How are you enjoying Side this? Four. How are you enjoying this? Is this is good. You know, this is the first time I've taken it apart song by song, which is really interesting to me because I, you know, sometimes just talking about the stuff, I learn things about it that I didn't necessarily know or think. You know, right, like yeah. the, this whole day in a life thing with circular is something I'm definitely going to think a little more about. Well, f first of all, let me just clarify that I'm <laughs> a, I'm an idiot. I'm just <laughs> I'm just listening and trying oh, to come on. spit things out. I yeah. might, I could be. There's no right or wrong here. But it, is, it must be fascinating that you, you would spend so much time on it, and I'm just processing it myself. Yeah. 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 So let's move on to uh, Thrown Over the Wall. Yeah.
This is one of my favorite tracks of the record, and this track, again, like has taken on this weird life that was not intended when it came about. That you know, there's there's been a lot of weird magic about this record, mm -hmm. and you know, when I wrote this song. I, at first, I didn't have hardly, hardly, hardly had any lyrics at all, but I had thrown over the wall, thrown over the wall, and you know I didn't know what it meant. And like I sent Jonathan an early demo where that was the only line of, of lyrics he could hear. It was thrown over the wall, thrown over the wall, and you know we started batting it around. And he sent me these lyrics. Again, he filled out most of the verses. He filled out the verses and I had the chorus and I had the whole middle section where it kind of goes into this weird hyperspace or whatever, mm -hmm. the alien insect section, I call it. And he had these verses that were based on like, you know, there's a little bit of a political edge going on. But again, like, you know, newspapers figure prominent for me. I'm a, a news junkie and I love nothing more than like, you know, getting the New York Times on my doorstep and like reading it. Physical and, newspapers still, well, that's you? Well, uh, three days a week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we still get physical papers. But right. I'm just addicted to the newspaper and the news. And, and I love the idea of a newspaper, you sure. know. And the Times is like a world-class newspaper. And uh, so there's references to newspapers in a couple songs, including Circular. And in this one, in this case, Jonathan was pulling stuff he had read in the newspaper. He was, he, you know, he, he saw some article about how, you know, and this is like literally the lyrics to the song, like the Chinese were using the sea to hide their submarines. And he thought like, that's the most preposterous thing What does that ever. mean? Yeah, what that's is what that? he said. He was like, what does that mean? They're using the sea to hide their submarines. That's where submarines live. Exactly. He's like, you know, what does it mean? And he thought it was so funny that he he wrote these lyrics, and it ends, you know, we're using the the clouds to hide our airplanes, yeah. and, uh, you know, using faces to disguise our names, and you know, all this kind of stuff. We disguise our faces with names. That's the lyric, and I think it's a beautiful one. Yeah. And you know, so he, uh, you know, we s smuggle facts inside a magazine. Uh, you know, he had all these interesting, like pseudo political. Uh, Things. And, you know, then we worked on the, the, those together to tighten them up a little bit at some point once we realized what we had. And it just somehow it made sense and it went with this thrown over the wall. I didn't know why. And then, like, I had this poem I'd written that we based the middle of the song on. And the middle of the song is uh, starts... You know, in this very strange, like watery voice, with the, the voice is shifts. really haunting. It's, it's, it, this is another Beatles trick. It's the, the voice is sung through a Leslie cabinet, oh, okay. so it's a rotating speaker, like John used on Tomorrow. Uh, all, you know, Tomorrow, never, Tomorrow knows. never knows. Yeah. You know, we wanted to affect the voice in some weird way, so we put a bunch of different effects on it. But the the lyrics start, uh, "Last of your kind, are you still hard?" And um, it's not really a sexual reference, but it it was spurred to me by like. I was walking down a street and I saw either the casing of a locust or a cicada or one of those creatures that like comes up every 17 years and uh -huh. then they live for a week or something and then they they die and it was it was stuck on the side of a tree and it was it was dead long dead but the you, it was still all there you know yeah. it was just like a hollow exoskeleton or something and somehow it prompted this poem in me that was all about this idea of like, you know, cities pass, like you, you, you're there and then you're gone and like cities pass or maybe not, you know, and like this kind of musing on, on like the, the transitory nature of, of life on any level, whether it's human or, or cicada or whatever, sure. you know. And so I had this center section and again, just like plopped it in the middle of this song. They didn't really have any rhyme or reason except that they seemed to go very nicely together. on the song and the song came together really nicely and then the guy that made the film towards the end of the process we were listening to the song a bunch of times as I was doing vocals and he was sitting on the couch listening in between filming takes and stuff 
And at some point, this is like September of 2016 or maybe August of 2016, you know, when we were all like super caught up in the election sure. and everything. And, you know, it hadn't occurred to me that I was talking about this wall and, you know, Trump was talking about I wondered about, about that, wall. yeah. And anyway, so my friend Fred says, well, you know, like, you know, nobody thought he was going to win. And Fred's like, well, you know, haha, if by some fucked up chance Donald Trump is elected president, this could be the song of the resistance, you know, and he right. just kind of threw it out there. And so all that fall, when I was starting to play some of these songs, I was playing this song and like, I was introducing it like that. I was saying, you know, telling the story about Fred's reaction to it and saying like, okay, so, you know, ha ha ha, if Trump gets elected, you know, everybody knew he wasn't going to get elected. <laughs> this could be the song of the resistance and, you know, offering it up kind of. And then like November 8th came and he did get elected. And like my impression giving that intro through the fall of that year was like, okay, come November 8th, I'm going to have to find something new to say about this song because yeah. I can't say this anymore. Hillary's going to be in the White House. And then it didn't came, come to pass. And so now I honestly say, like, this is my song to the resistance. And, you know, again, like this layer of meaning that we didn't intend that worked so perfectly with Jonathan's lyrics and, like, the end lyrics are, like, you know... Um, uh, a, a child to unholster the gun you sent a lamb to confront the wolf and you know all this stuff mm -hmm. and they all worked very perfectly for the moment the political moment that we're in in the states and and so you know it's become my song to the resistance and like i was telling you earlier i was just down in brazil and like you know there's a whole lot of similar things going on there so i could talk about this song in a way that they were responding to you yeah. know and they've yeah. got uh, a hashtag down there that is their equivalent of not my president, you know, and it's yeah. spray painted on all the walls. It's for a Temer. The guy in power is called Temer and it's, it means get out Temer. And, you know, uh, there's all this stuff going on down there and like a lot of different places I've been over the last year where there's like these conservative upheavals and things. You know, you guys are lucky. You've got uh, Trudeau number two in power and like things are looking very rosy up here in well, a lot relatively of speaking, we're not yeah, relatively <laughs> speaking. Yeah. You know, it was great when he and Obama were sitting together. It was just like, man, these are two of the coolest dudes on the planet right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, but uh, you know, we're in a mess, a, a, a really big mess at home. And so, you know, it, to be able to offer it up genuinely as my protest song, my song for the resistance, it's kind of working on that level. And, you know, it's, it's nice. It's a comforting thing for me to have that in my repertoire at the moment, because it gives me a chance in front of the public to actually like talk about all this stuff. And, you know, mostly I'm talking about, you know, especially the middle of this song is about this, like, you know, cities pass, you know, decades pass, like life changes and, you know, comes and goes. And like, you know, like I, I'm encouraging people to look ahead 50 years or 75 years and not get dragged backwards into like the white man's world of 1940 or 50 or right. whatever it is, you know. So it's 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 been a good song for me to have have some like, you know, current event stuff to talk about in front of a crowd and, you know, say my piece. I remember talking to you about Occupy Wall Street and how much that meant to you yeah. in New York. Yeah. And, and yeah. I know that that's been a thread yeah. throughout your your, your solo material in particular. Yeah. yeah, well this song was, was, was started, that's what I was thinking about when we were working on it. I was thinking about the Occupy movement yeah. and it kind of, you know, it kind of died down after its first, you know, I mean, I think I was at an Occupy encampment here in Toronto. I believe that's, yeah. Uh, we went, everywhere I went, I was going and seeking them out and checking out because we were living right near Zuccotti Park. That's right. And, uh, going there a lot and like yeah. taking our kids there almost as like history lessons, you mm -hmm. know, like modern history in unfolding right before our eyes in a way. Um, yeah, so, you know, th there was a, there's a bit of Occupy in there too yeah. in those lyrics about yeah. hiding the sea, you know, and, and all this stuff with China that's going on, it's like, and Korea, it's like, that song is, is, is uh, got some great happenstance yeah. going on. Resonance, yeah. yeah, resonance, yeah. All right, well, we are on to the uh, final song, uh, New Thing, New which thing. has an accompanying uh, music video. I don't, does, yeah. does any, do any other songs? Circular. Have? Circular as well. had a video well. before New Thing, and yeah. Right, New uh, Thing has a, a really uh, vivid video, and, uh, Again, directed by Gal uh, Naomi Yang of Galaxy 500. Oh, okay. She's been doing a lot of videos the last few years, and she did that video. It's with a me. great video. Yeah, you know, it was really funny because uh, they told me they wanted to use new thing, especially in England. I think Mute wanted to use new thing because they thought it was the kind of song that 
BBC radio might play. Here's the we, thing. If we cut yeah. it down. Yeah. You know? And yeah. So they, they I thought that. that song was good, but they said like, you know, I thought I, I would have till the record came out to make that video. And they were like, no, we're going to release this in 10 days. And so like, I was like, oh my God, I called Naomi up and she was like, well, I'm coming to New York this weekend. Let's, I was like, are you up for a gorilla style video? And she was like, yeah, I'm coming down this weekend. <laughs> Let's do some stuff, something really quick and see what happens. So we, that video from start to finish took like seven days, which was oh. kind of a great way to make a video. Sometimes they drag on forever. And for people who haven't uh, seen it, you're, you're kind of walking around a city and you've got this device, this contraption. Well, I have this early 1970s JVC black and white TV and AM FM radio unit that is shaped like a plastic pyramid. It's about uh, a foot and a half tall. It's white. It's a white plastic pyramid and the TV set f unfolds from the top of the pyramid and it's, it's like a little four inch black and yeah. white screen. It's like yeah. the most useless device in the world. <laughs> and uh, you know, I told Naomi, like, you know, my this song is my song about the internet. And that was the truth. When I started writing the song, I had the chorus first. You know, you're, everybody's talking about a new thing. And I was thinking about this whole idea of, like, social media yeah. and the way, like, you know, a friend of mine said to me, like, I've almost got a thousand friends. I'm almost to a thousand friends. And I was like, I was just thinking about it in my mind. It's like, are they really your friends or not? And like everybody talks about their friends in this yeah. abstract sense these days, like right. getting their likes in and all that stuff. Well, and it's actually, called social media. Yeah. So the social yeah. part is friends and liking. Yeah. It's very yeah. warm, supposedly, but it's also very extremely cold yeah. and alienating. It's very confusing. Yeah, it's yeah. very confusing. And when I first started working that song, I had this chorus. Uh, everybody's talking about a new thing. And I wasn't. And as soon as I made it up, I decided it was about the Internet. It wasn't like I first thought about the Internet. and then. Made, but it's just like one of those lines that comes to you when you're strumming the sure. guitar. And then I was like, OK, this is about the Internet. And Jonathan really helped me a lot with these lyrics. We sent these lyrics back and forth a lot. And, um, but anyway, so, you know, I tell this to Naomi and like the next day, you know, we have one or two days to prepare before she's coming to New York. And she sends me this thing on eBay with this, this unit, you know, like foot and a half tall hunk of useless plastic <laughs> from 1970 JVC. She's like, what do you think about this as something for the video? And like, it was $500. <laughs> For basically, like, this, the FM AM radio sounded great. It had a really nice speaker. Oh, in nice. It, but it was like, you know, it was a useless piece of outmoded technological junk. Right. That somebody thought, and I was like, I don't know, Naomi, it's $500. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and the next day she's like, I bought it. I think it's going to be great. <laughs> and, and she was totally right. And, and it was my stand in for like the cell phone. Like, yeah, I carried iPhones, it around yeah. the city and yeah. onto the subway and like over to the riverfront and everything. In a trance. In a yeah, kind of in, a, in that hypnotic trance that everybody does these days. You know, it's kind of uncanny when you walk down the street. Nobody's looking at the buildings or the sky. Everybody's <laughs> looking at their phone. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> it makes me wonder like when, when, like when the first iPhone was released, it was kind of like Steve Jobs had, had foisted this marvel on the world. And now I wonder like, you know, it, it has its amazing things, but there's times when it's like, God, everybody's so deep inside of their phones. And like, you have a very young child, but you'll see two, as they get two older. Young children, yeah. Oh, you do? I have two. Oh, yeah. oh, you, oh only I have one a six is a year, girl. I have a six year old okay, boy named Levon. My only daughter, and I thought yeah, you were No, I know. I kid. confused myself earlier, yeah. but yeah, I have a daughter, and, uh, and they both, uh, my son Levon is six, and he. They use the iPads for yeah. like the games and yeah. stuff, and, and I'm you know, wary of it. My kids are teenagers uh, in, in their middle to late teens now, and they're like just so, their world is so inside of the phone and like chat groups and like, you know, all this newfangled stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't trying to be critical of it, but I was just trying to give it a good look. And, you know, the, the video cuts out the center section of the song, which we were calling like the Steve Reich section, because it has all these marimbas and yeah. all this repeated stuff. And me and Sharon using, uh, the word like and another like in a kind of Meredith Monk round like fashion right. where we're doing it in different tempos and rhythms throughout this whole middle section of the song that's on the album version but not on the video version but uh, yeah so it was really fun to make the video and just do this weird you know use this outmoded piece of junk you know we could have used one of those early cell phones that was like the size of your 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 oxford yeah loafer, yeah yeah sure yeah, you know? yeah 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 but she found this which was even better and like right. it really i really built up my biceps carrying it around <laughs> new york and brooklyn all day that couple days we shot heard a message on the airwaves it isn't safe to come So steal away like two binaries A mirrored mountain top under blue dome Try to 
I've already rocked your world a little bit with one Beatles reference. Yeah. May I? May I uh, please do. May I please uh, mention the fact that I, at least the first couple of verses and maybe the first chorus, I couldn't help but think of Imagine by John Lennon. Oh, I think somebody else actually said that too. You don't do the, the piano doesn't do the turnaround yeah. in Imagine, but it seems to be the same progression. Yeah, it's similar. I, I, I guess I should figure out if the chords are similar, but you know, this song to me was the most traditional song. We struggled a lot with it because it, the basic structure was the most traditional, like verse, yeah. chorus, verse, chorus. And you know, it has this weirdo middle section, but it was the hardest one to, to lock in and it was the hardest one for me to start playing on my own live. I mean, it took me forever. I just started playing this one in the last like month or two, even though I've been playing a lot of the songs from this record for like the last year. Um, I finally kind of like figured out how to be comfortable with the fact that it is a little bit of a traditional song with a traditional verse chorus structure. And like, I really love the song, you know, but no, it's, it's uh, wonderful. And, yeah. and, and like, imagine like, which I consider to be this, it's obviously a social commentary, sociocultural mm -hmm. commentary, but it's kind of sarcastic. Yeah. And it's I, a little uh, sarcastic. Yeah. And when I first, when all I had was the chorus, the new thing chorus, I was thinking of like third velvet underground record and where they were doing like the quieter songs and yeah. you know, like if you close the door, like I was kind of, thinking about it like that everybody's talking about a new thing and I knew it had the potential to have a lot of oh, different like right. harmonies and things right. and indeed the end of this song is like a long almost fade out with lots of different layers of like round like harmonies between me and Sharon and Raul and and that was really fun to work on um, you know and it's another song where like the after the first verse chorus there's this weird like 70s like synth thing that goes on like this really bubbly uh, synth thing going on and at first I was like okay there's no way we're keeping that man that's like so insane and in the end we did and later on I was like oh no I decided I liked it you know it was really good but you know it just just building them up was really fun yeah no record, it's like, it's a, out where they were gonna go it's a great song it is funny that you mentioned that you you thought Moroccan mountains was an odd opener because uh, I assume new thing was was uh, thought of as a potential opener at some point no i guess no? i always thought of it as a closer, as a closer? Because i could always see that round of new thing kind of continuing forever and oh, fading right. out into the distance right that uh, that song always to me was like the last song on a side anyway okay okay you know thinking in vinyl terms which i still really like to do uh, sure you know at one point i was hoping this would be a single vinyl because i love the idea of like a, an opening and closing song on two sides but because it was too long for that it's double it's vinyl, a double so it's, vinyl like yeah. every, every side has almost two songs so there's <laughs> every song on the record <laughs> is either a first or last song on a side so it doesn't quite have the same analogy but new thing was always going to be la a last song on a side well it's like fading into the distance that that uh, yeah that makes sense i see your i see your point there yeah. well uh we did it we talked about all cool. of electric trim i hope this was fulfilling yeah. for you and interesting yeah, no, in it was ways. really good and i think you know in our prelude we talked about all the different ways in which the record was made and everything i think we covered a lot of good yeah, stuff yeah so what's coming up next for you and and how do you tour a record like this i'm just curious you mentioned that raul plays with you live but do you have yep. Did you, you had to form a band for this? I did. I kind of formed a new band. We did a tour. We did two tours last year where we were playing a bunch of this material. We did one with just me and Raul and a, another Spanish guy playing bass. And then in the fall of last year, we, we toured the three of us plus this young woman from Brooklyn on drums who was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And she could play the real drum kit and she could play the drum pads. And so between the four of us and the fact that everybody sang, we were able to recreate a lot of this record with all the harmonies and like the electronic drums on the pads and the real drums and everything. So it was a really amazing tour. Oh, cool. And now, you know, that's almost a year ago. I'm, uh, I'm putting together a new band the first tour is in October and we'll come through Toronto and oh, Montreal yeah. and I think the first tour is going to be Raul and I and he'll play uh, keyboard synth and sampler as well as electric guitar and I'll play mostly acoustic guitar and rather than a drummer we're going to have a percussionist who also plays some electronics and electronic drums and I think we're going to start it out 
you know, I've been playing a lot of this stuff acoustic the last year or so, and I'm yeah. getting pretty good at it. And I thought the way to start, especially since this first tour was booked long before the record was ready to come out, and like, so the fees are not great. I didn't want to go out with a full band where I sure. had to, you know, spend extra money to make it happen. So we thought, like, let's go out as almost like a chamber group with like a percussionist, uh, Raul on auxiliary, stu auxiliary stuff, and me just singing and playing acoustic guitar. And then the next tour, we're going to add a bass player and probably add Alan as well and, um, you know, build it up slowly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one real inspiration uh, came to me last year, or I don't know, like a year or so ago when we were working pretty hard on the record. And Leah and I went to see PJ Harvey play in New York. Oh my God! When she was playing her new record, that, I don't know if you saw oh the band, my, the big that band tour that she's was got. Unbe that's still one of the. I saw yeah. it at Massey Hall. Yeah. Oh wow! One Fantastic. of the greatest things I've ever seen. Yeah. Same here. We still. Everyone who went, we still talk about yeah, it. I yeah. I talked about it like mad for a while. And one of the things I loved about it was like she had obviously a lot of percussion. Sometimes yes. four or five people were playing percussion, but she had two quote unquote drummers, but neither one of them had a kick, had yeah. a kit, and nobody had a kick drum pedal yeah. on stage, and so. So that immediately changed the whole no notion of what the percussion was and what her like a little armada of percussion was. <laughs> yeah. But it really made a big impression on me how like just moving away from a traditional rock drum kit changed everything. So like I think the drummer for our first tour is going to be either standing or at least like he'll have some some bits and pieces but there won't be a whole drum kit and and uh you know so I, we, i'm taking a lot of inspiration okay. from what pj was doing well, at good. that point that's yeah. great so you've i assume your focus then is on electric trim for the foreseeable future yeah we're, we're about to start work on songs for a new record oh, I mean, okay. i've started i've got a bunch of them collected uh, like demos just like yeah. before and i think it'll be interesting to see what Raul and I come up with and Jonathan come up with the second time around because I think the working process is bound to be quite different yeah I mean like we we were lucky to have you know a year where we could dedicate a lot of time to making this record in a very languid way like we were speaking about before this record might be a little bit different but uh, you know I think we'll take all the things we've learned about this process and and compound them on the next stuff we do okay. so you know we're just about to get started on it but you know the record is still about to be released so I I sort of foresee my next six or eight months at least working on these songs maybe slowly starting to seep some other okay. ones into the set as they're ready that's awesome that's great yeah. to hear now I assume people listening uh, this, this far uh, are also Sonic Youth fans. Yeah. Is there any reissue <clears throat> news, any news about the band that you can share? Um, you know, we're always working on archival stuff. Yeah. And right now we've all been so busy that that's slowed down. But the big project we're working on right now is uh, there was this thing we put out on VHS tape back in the day that was called Screaming Fields of Sonic Love. Oh, yeah, and it yeah. was all of the videos from... Death Valley 69, which was the first one we made in like 84 or 85, up through when we signed to Geffen. So like everything from the 80s that we did in the video world. Yep. So there were videos for like songs from Sister and songs from Daydream. And there were like a few live things like Iggy sitting in with us at the at a gig in England and stuff like that. So it's about 14 videos plus a whole bunch of new live stuff that we found. And it's been almost ready for release for like six or eight months. And we've been so busy we haven't been able to like oh, okay. finish it off. But that's the next thing and then you know we've got tons of archival stuff yeah. that we want to release I mean I was telling somebody earlier today one thing I really want to do is um, for certain records like washing machine and uh, New York City Ghosts and Flowers records where those songs really evolved much further when we started yeah. playing them live yeah. after we made the records I'd love to release like a washing machine record that that's a live version of the album like song for song oh, yeah, like same sequence yeah. but just live versions of all the songs oh, the cool. same thing from Ghosts and Flowers because yeah. that's the record we made right after all our gear got stolen yeah. and we were playing on all this funky gear and later those songs became much more ferocious and that record was kind of contentious when it came out you know? yeah yeah Pitchfork gave us a 0, 0.0 at the time. And really? Ghost yeah, of Flowers? They gave us a 0, 0.0. And then like 15 years later, the same writer recanted and said like, you know, I was totally wrong. It that was really stupid incredible. of me. Yeah, well, that's what we thought. But, you know, we knew it was a weirdo record. It wasn't a It's a post 9-11 record, record, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, or no, that's, actually, uh, that's Murray Street. No, Murray Street was. Yeah. It was in 2000 it was right or something, or 99 yeah. or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was the like first that. record yeah, we did yeah. with Jim O'Rourke involved. That's right. No, it's beautiful. Yeah, I love that record. Yeah. But those songs even like I would love to see a live version of that record because those songs evolved into like really fierce stuff on yeah. stage. New York yeah. City Ghosts and Flowers, the song, and Nevermind, and Free City Rhymes, and a couple of the other ones. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I would love to do stuff like that. We've got amazing live just stuff a matter in the of, can. It's a matter yeah. of finding someone to do it. Yeah. And, you know, we're not playing together. We're not thinking about playing together or working together at this point. Everybody's, you know, I have to say between me and Thurston and Kim, I think we're all super involved and super happy with where we are right now. We're not looking back at it. You know, yeah. we're always asked... Is sure, there any sure, chance sure, yeah. all that stuff? And, you know, Kim's the only one who said it's never going to happen. You know, but, I mean, I, I always say, you know, let's never say never. You never know what's going to happen. I only ask, I, I ask, and, I just you know, ask if people are, I, the only thing I would wonder is if everyone's getting along. That's all. Well. I mean, obviously that's not going to be. I don't think Thurston and Kim are getting yeah, along any right. better than they were in, yeah. back in the day for a lot of reasons, past and present. Yeah. But, you know, I speak to Thurston and Kim all the time. Oh, good. You know, That's what I've I mean. I've spoken yeah. to both of them a few times this week, yeah, practically this week or last week, yeah. or, you know, spoken or emailed or whatever. Yeah. But we see each other a lot. Thurston and I see each other a, a lot. And for a while, Steve, it was see, I was seeing him a lot. I haven't seen him in a while. He's off with Thurston a yeah, lot. Yeah, he's off yeah. with Thurston yeah. a lot these days. But, I, you know, I talk to Thurston regularly on email. And, and, you know, we also, like, have poetry stuff going on in common and have <laughs> done some show. We've done a couple duo shows, him and me. We did a thing in Paris together and a thing in New York at the stone together and uh he opened solo for my band in london last time we were there and so we see we, we stay in touch that's we all, all we all stay in touch that's all i want to know the, yeah the pair that had the big rift you know i, so. I was uh, among i was lucky i saw sonic youth many many times yeah 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 i don't yeah. clamor uh, for the band but i as a fan of you as people you know and again i don't know you all very well but yeah i just hope you're all okay yeah because i no, really I thought of it all... as a it's a family band to me you know yeah no it always has been that we're we're um we're we're doing very well okay we're good doing very well good at good the moment, i have to say good so lee where can people learn more about you on the new thing well um on the new thing on the on the interwebs <laughs> well my website is a great source it's soup you know sonic youth website is also a great source they're both super deep sites leeronaldo.com or sonicyouth.com okay. mine has a lot of information about you know like i've been concentrating a lot on these spoken word i'm mean, not spoken word on these this kind of singer songwriter career sure. at the moment sure. but i do a lot of still abstract playing leah and i do a lot of our thing with the movies and the hanging guitar and a lot of improv music with either text of light or glacial or other situations and i'm doing a lot of writing and a lot of visual art these days i'm having a couple uh, big visual, big for me, visual art shows in Europe in October this year, and, and my visual art work has really been coming along. And so, if you go to LeeRonaldo.com or SonicYouth.com, there's just layers and layers okay. of, of depth to see there. That's, and you're on all the place. you're on all the social Instagram media. Instagram is what yeah. I do. You're great at I that. I don't ever do Facebook or no. <laughs> Twitter, but my Instagram posts go to both of those. Yeah. So it appears I'm active there. But I love Instagram. I love the poetry of like one single image, and yeah. that's totally my jam. I'm nice. obsessed with instagram okay so people can so find yeah. lee ronaldo yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's yeah i'm looking for more friends ha ha <laughs> <laughs> is there a, a sing we've talked about all the songs is there a single song that we can play for people so they can hear the whole thing uh right now what, um, would, you, what would you choose well um you know circular is kind of a good introduction i love moroccan mountains as a longer form introduction okay you know uncle skeleton is also a favorite <laughs> although it's a very odd song in the course sure. of the record it's the only one with that kind of a beat on it so maybe it's you know i think mute has scheduled it for like the fourth thing they do uh, sure you know, from the record sure. after circular new thing i think the next one will be moroccan mountains and there's a really lovely video for that that the same guy that sh shot the movie shot he went to morocco for the first time recently and shot all this footage that we used in the video for yeah. moroccan mountains so um well yeah. i mean if you want to pick any one of those i'm fine with it um let's see <laughs> um well, if if timing is not an issue, let's do let's do Electric Trim. Let's do the title song. Sure. That's got so much going on with it. Yeah, and we discussed it extensively, yeah. so people know what it's about. Yeah. Let's yeah. go to it. This is Electric Trim by Lee Ronaldo. Lee, it's always an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for being back on my Same show. Same here. It's great to be back in Toronto and great to be talking to you again.
that so do you
was the 354th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Antica Podcast Network and is available on iTunes, Audioboom, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Overcast, among many other podcast platforms. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for or you wish to learn more about me, please visit vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control with Vishkana on Facebook. You can follow the show on Twitter at vishcreative. You can also follow me at vishkana. Listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time, around the world at CFRU.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. And for your generosity, I am willing to send you a a t-shirt Uh, that represents the show or perhaps some other kind of gift send me a note we'll work something out this episode would not be possible without our sponsors Pete's Trocadero whom you can call for pickup or delivery in Guelph at 519-829-2444 or check them out at trocaderoguelph.ca the bookshelf an independently owned bookstore bar music venue and movie theater located at 41 Quebec Street in Guelph learn more about them at bookshelf.ca Planet Bean freshly roasted fair trade certified organic coffee planetbeancoffee.com for more information about them. Granddad's Donuts, located at 574 James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. Amazing Donuts. Visit granddads.ca for more information about them. And to have a whole wonderful meal's worth of ingredients, along with a recipe, a how-to guide for what to do with those ingredients to make an amazing meal, you can have all of this delivered right to your Canadian home just by visiting HelloFresh.ca and uh, signing up for a week's worth of food. And if you use the promo code CREATIVE50 for 50% off your first order, that would be great. You save 50% off your first order. Again, CREATIVE50 is the promo code that you can use. All right. Thank you to Lee Ronaldo for that uh, extensive chat about Electric Trim and Sonic Youth and his life and work. It's nice to have Lee back on the show. He's been on before, and uh, it's always a treat. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for another episode. More to come. I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now.